tell you in judge school that these outfits are itchy. Is that who I think it is? Is that Notorious ORB joining us again today? I am so honored, ma'am. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Yes, I'm here to give the verdict on the next three, other than satisfied, NIST 800-171 controls. I will provide a verdict and decide. Excellent. Well, we're very happy to have you here and definitely happy to have that authority that you have. Because truly, we want to make sure that we can help our audience get through these other than satisfied. And, and having an expert like yourself, it, it makes all the difference. I think it behooves us to start this discussion by explaining what the other than satisfied controls are and what we mean by the top 10. Absolutely. So other than satisfied, when we reference that or OTS, we're referencing a group of, of information that we have from DIBCAC. So DIBCAC is the assessor organization for the DOD. And back in December of 2022, they compiled a top 10 list of the most likely to be other than satisfied controls. So we did the first three in our, the last time you were so gracious to, to join us, um, ORB. And now we're going to do the next set of the three, which I believe you have that list. Is that right? Yes, it is on the docket today. We will discuss periodically assessing risk, scanning for vulnerabilities, review and update logged events. Let us start with periodically assessing risk. So as it is understood by the greater, the greater audience, periodically assessing risk means that you look at the sources of vulnerability to your system, whether those be outside risks, such as intruders, whether those be viruses for your computer, other types of risks that might be to your organization. And you must frequently look at those lists of risks and assess your logs against any potential variations. Do I have that correct? That's pretty much it. So from a high level, and I'll read the control just to make sure that we're all on the same page about it, but it's periodically assessing the risk to an organization's operation. That includes mission, function, image, reputation, everything. It also is organizational assets. It's individuals themselves like insider threat. Organizational assets are things like endpoint devices, laptops, mobile phones, all kinds of different things. And resulting from the operation of organizational systems and the associated processing, storage, and transmission of CUI. So you're not just assessing risk in a broad term. And I think this is probably, this is something that um, I'm very surprised that this is so low down. I thought that this was going to be much higher on the on the top 10 list. I'm amazed it's only number four. I thought it would be more like number two because this is a very tricky one for a lot of different OSCs or organizations seeking certification that are out there trying to become compliant. It's talking about us periodically assessing risk, which means that you have to do it at a certain cadence, whatever that is, but it has to be to everything in your organization, to everyone in your organization specifically dealing with the risks associated with processing, storing, and transmitting CUI. So that's that's the tricky little caveat in there that has to be really, you have to pay really close attention to that. So it's not just risk in general, it's also it's risk especially specifically talking about with CUI. Now it can be part of a larger risk compliance framework you have for the whole company, but we're specifically talking about CUI in this. So why is it acceptable? <clears throat> to say periodically and for one person that could be once a week and for another organization that could be once a quarter absolutely and those are equally acceptable yeah that's actually a very good point so the reason for that is kind of the whole reason for cmmc in the first place the idea is that cmmc is supposed to be and so is nist 8171 for that matter non-prescriptive and that means that you're not going to get told hey you have to use this tool hey you have to use this procedure hey you have to use this frequency it's really up to every individual organization to make that decision. Now, with that, with a caveat, if you say I periodically assess risk once a year, you're probably going to make your C3PAO or whoever's assessing you kind of raise an eyebrow because that's really no, a risk once a year assessment is just nowhere near enough. As we all know, risks constantly change and evolve over time. So 
once a year would probably not get you very far. Even once a quarter is probably, you could probably get away with once a quarter, but that's kind of dicey. Usually once a month is a really great cadence for risk. Again, it depends on the organization. And this is not by any means me telling you you have to do it once a month, but I'm just saying that it is definitely more, it's more fondly looked upon by your assessors if you have it more at like a once a month cadence versus once a year or once a quarter even. All right. So has, as it has been said, you need to assess the risk to your CUI from yes. both systems and uh, from your space, your office space and do what you can to frequently assess that risk and make sure that risk is contained. And make sure that it, they're defined. You want to make sure that you have a defined list of, okay, here are our risks that we are, we are tracking and evaluating. You need to have a procedure for that. For example, like something that we do internally at Prevail is we have a once, once monthly risk meeting and all of the executive staff and myself running it as the compliance officer come in, we have a meeting agenda, we have a conversation about all of our different risks that we're tracking constantly. And those risks need to be evaluated, discussed, and then meeting notes are taken so that for our own assessments, because we get assessed on this, this type of stuff as well, because we're 853 company. So from an 853 standpoint, we also get assessed on that. So when our assessors come in, they look at those meeting minutes, those meeting notes, they see, okay, yep, and once a month, every month, just like we said in our SSP and in our policies. So again, whatever that cadence is, whatever that periodic assessment looks like to you, that needs to be stated clearly in all of your documentation so that everybody in the company understands that. And then you also have to remember that it's specifically talking about processing, storing, and transmitting CUI and everything involved in that people like places that they're going to be working at you know facility locations you've got to think about it from a reputation standpoint there's so many different pieces of that so it's definitely a lot more complex than it appears just from the from the title of it case closed all right coming up on our next um other than satisfied issue is scanning for vulnerabilities. Now this seems like it is a subset of the previous, um, of the previous uh, uh, control, which is periodically assess risk. Shouldn't part of that be scanning for vulnerabilities? How is this separate and why is it defined as its own issue and how do you meet it? Valid, valid questions. These are such great questions. I would expect nothing less. So from a vulner vulnerabilities and risks are two different things that can be the same. So a vulnerability specifically in this case is talking about usually technological vulnerabilities. So for example, if I have Google, you know, anybody who uses Google Chrome, that's, you know, it's a browser that a lot of people use. It's very popular. If you go into Google Chrome, a lot of times in the upper right hand corner, it'll say update. And that means that there's an update that's needed for Google Chrome. It's probably a security patch, or maybe it's an update of features, but the idea being that if there are any security vulnerabilities that have been identified by Google in that current version that you have, that you haven't updated yet, a vulnerability scanner will pick that up. So vulnerability scanner is a program that you can put onto, you know, all of your endpoint devices that will scan out and say, oh, this, this laptop right here, I see that it has an outdated version of Chrome. Based on the information I know from Google stating that there are multiple vulnerabilities inside that current version, I'm going to say that this is a medium vulnerability or a high vulnerability or a critical vulnerability or a low vulnerability. And then let's say that I am working at that company and I'm responsible for looking at those vulnerability scans and sort of evaluating them. I'm going to then go into my vulnerability scanner, Tenable or Sentinel, or there's a bunch of them out there. Let's say I go into, into my admin console and I see, oh, you know, Noel has a computer that's got an out of date version of Google Chrome that has a vulnerability that's listed as high. I need to immediately address that. Okay. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. That's up to the company. So this, this specific control and others like it, there, there are other ones that sort of feed into this. It's talking about scanning vulnerabilities in the organization and then you have to do something about those vulnerabilities. So it's not just, I have a vulnerability scanner. I let it scan things. It tells me a bunch of stuff and I just forget about it. You have to actually have some sort of procedure and process for how you address those vulnerabilities. Now, a vulnerability, to your point, a vulnerability can become a risk. It absolutely can. If your vulnerability is so widespread that every, every endpoint in the company has it, 
there is a real risk that somebody could end up having a security incident because of it, because you've just got so many people who have it. Now, if you have one person who has it and you just get on the phone with them and say, hey, update your Google Chrome, it's probably not a risk, but it was still a vulnerability, if that makes sense. So risk is, again, risk is something that you have to sort of evaluate for yourself as a company. And some risks are going to have higher value points than others are. Some are going to be more likely to happen than others. Some are going to be more severe than others if they do happen and that kind of thing. Whereas vulnerabilities, that's something that's already happened. And then you have to address it somehow. And it could be considered a risk. And so does this not get to the heart of the matter, Ms. Vestal, about the vagueness at some points of NIST? Because it does say scan for vulnerabilities, but it is not prescriptive. Indeed, you are absolutely right. And that is another reason why I know that, you know, if Orly were here, she would she would definitely know this for sure. But I'm sure you probably do, too, just in your line of work. You know, we have those objectives underneath the controls. It's so important to read those through and really understand because those objectives are sort of your little task list of things that you have to get done in order for that control to be addressed. And one of the things that it states in one, like what I think it's actually the last objective. Yeah, it is the last objective. Scans are performed on applications when new vulnerabilities are identified. Okay, so you have to constantly be scanning or have a frequency of scanning. So you have to make that decision for you as well. Are you gonna do a continuous scanning? Is it just gonna constantly be running like with a tenable or a sentinel or something like that? Or is it something where you only run it once a week or once every two weeks or whatever? So you have to make sure that you have that defined procedural process of when you're scanning, how often you're scanning, and what happens when those new vulnerabilities are identified. You know, a, a good example is what we just talked about. Well, okay, well, what if, you know, I say I immediately go to our risk assessment. I, go, you know, if there's something I can't handle with one person, I immediately put it on the risk, you know, the risk list. And we talk about it in that risk meeting that we discussed, you know, once a month. That's a good example. If it's something that's a little bit less where it's, you know, hey, I'm just going to have one email sent to somebody. Do you still document that? I don't know. But again, whatever that procedure and process is, has to be very, very clearly defined in your SSP and your policy documents, all your procedural documents. Case closed. Let us get to the last one that we will discuss today, and that is review and update logged events. Yep. So you have to define what events you are going to log, what you are reviewing, and what to do if you find an issue. Yes. What's the next step, who's the alert? Please explain to the to the council what is this that we're, what exactly are we looking at when we are looking at logged events? Because you log just about every event in a uh, in a digital environment today. How do you determine what events you will review, which events uh, you don't, and what do you do once you catch something? That's, these are great questions as always. So really from the, the list of what you review from an audit standpoint, the, so when we say events, we mean things that happen in the audit log. So for an example, like, like you just pointed out, almost everything is, is captured somewhere. So every time I log into my machine, every time I log into an application, you know, there are audit logs somewhere saying, you know, I logged in, you know, this is what I accessed. This is what I did. Now, obviously, as we, as we can imagine, the more people you have, the more audit events you're going to have. The more endpoints you have, the more audit logs, you know, more audit logs you're going to have. There's just, there's the more people and stuff that you're going to have in your scope, obviously it's going to get bigger. But if we're looking at, let's just say like, you know, maybe you have five people at your company and you're trying to, you know, make sure that you look at all the right things and all the audit logs, they're very overwhelming because they're, they are very big and overwhelming. I get it. So you want to make sure to narrow it down to things that are really specific to possible incidents, like somebody trying to constantly log in. So like, for example, if you're looking at an audit log and you see Noel Vestal tried to log in seven times in the same minute, that looks kind of suspicious, I would imagine. You're thinking, yes. well, how did she do that? What it could be is a denial of service attack. It could be there could be a man in the middle attack. There could be so many different attacks that could be happening from that. So that's a good example of a type of event that you might want, you would say, oh, I want to make sure to look at this. It's on my list of types of events to look for. I'm going to investigate this further. You investigate it further and then you react in whatever way your company decides that you need to, whatever the process and procedure is. 
If it's an incident, you'd likely follow your incident response plan or incident you know, response procedures. Maybe it's not an incident. Maybe you looked into that and it was some sort of mistake on my part. You know, maybe I like did something wrong and my MFA got confused or something like that. You have that conversation with me, you investigate and then you say, you know what? And you mark somewhere, you make sure to make that clear. I investigated this, this is the result that I see. So that's really essential too. It's not just, this is the procedure for how we do this. It's also documenting that to have that artifact to say, oh, here's the list of all the times that I've seen something that was a little questionable in when I do my audit log assess, you know, review once a week or once every three days or whatever it is that you decide. This is another one where you're absolutely right. There is so much gray area for this. Like it is a frequency that you get to define. I personally think, again, this is just my personal opinion and, and nothing else. I personally think that if you're doing less than once a week, you're probably not doing it enough. Um, audit logs are constantly changing. If you can get it where there's, if you have a third party tool that can ingest that those audit logs and sort of review them for you and help you sort of narrow things down, that's great. But you don't have to have that. If you're a very, very small company, especially like that may not make sense financially. You can absolutely do this manually. I have done it myself. Um, it is time consuming, but you can certainly do it. And you just have to make sure to document everything very clearly, make sure that you understand what the procedure is like also have a procedure defined. Okay, if I do see this type of event, if I see an event where I think that someone might be trying to attack the system, what are my procedures? Do I contact the user? Do I contact IT? Do I have a conversation with executive staff? Like, who do I talk to? And then once I talk to them, what are my standard procedures afterwards? This is another example, yet again, of where each one of these individual controls are really not individual. They are interconnected in a million different ways. Because if you find something in your review and the logging of those events, you're probably going to have to go ahead and initiate your incident response what or possibly add it to the risk list. Leave. I'm telling you, exactly. So these are all very interconnected, especially these three all are very directly interconnected with each other. So that's it's not surprising to me that they're all clumped together in this other than satisfied because so, as you can see, as we talk through them, they're all very interconnected, those three. Would you say that the common thread here is just the vagueness that can be interpreted in each of these? I, I would say that that's probably the issue with NIST 800-171 across the board. But yes, definitely with these, because, and, and again, if, if people have not looked at like the 800-171A guide or the CMMC assessor's guide for level two, they go into more detail about a lot of these things. There's a lot of discussion and additional pieces of information that I've always found very helpful. So I'm hoping that our, you know, our audience is also looking at that because if you're just looking at the control and even just the control and the objectives, it's, it's very complicated to, I mean, if I'm looking at 3.3.3, just as a regular person, it states review and update logged events. Okay, sure. I will review them. Look at me. I looked at them. Look, I wrote down that I looked at them and we're done. No, it's, it's more, it's more nuanced than that. And even if you look at the objective, Okay, a process for determining when to review the logs is identified. Okay, I do it once a week. Done. I got that handled. Events types being logged or reviewed in accordance with the defined review process. I review them once a week. I make sure everything's fine. Done. But you see how that would not be enough <laughs> for an assessor. But it's understandable. I can totally understand why somebody would read this and go, okay, cool, no problem. And, you know, I'm done. It's, it's more nuanced than that. So definitely make sure, you know, for everybody out there in, in TV land today, if there is any way that you can sort of dive more into them in the 800-171-A and or the CMMC Assessor's Guide, please do. It will help immensely, I promise. All right. On that, we're going to call it case closed. Case closed. And the jury and court will adjourn for the day until we return next time for another session of ORB. Thank you.